everyone. Um, my name is Alana Schlenker. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to everyone for having me here. Um, I know a lot of people probably feel like this, but since November, sometimes it, it feels hard to feel okay about being excited about design, and I've been excited about design for the last two days, and so this is really awesome, so thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, my name is Alana Schlenker. I, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Um, <laughs> since 2010, 2011, I've been publishing a magazine called Gratuitous Type, which features projects and interviews from graphic designers, type designers, um, but also artists, product designers, and publishers. That's why I'm here today, obviously, but very briefly, I just want to give you a little bit of background on me. Uh, I run my own studio. Uh, I work under my own name. I do pretty varied work uh, from branding to books to interactive projects, which I'm just kind of going to zip through because we don't have a ton of time. Uh, I intentionally keep a pretty small practice. I have uh, a couple people I bring on part-time. Um, I sometimes collaborate with my studio mate, Mark Pernice. Um, none of that's in here, but we've been doing some new projects together, and that's been really nice. Um, but I stay small in part because it gives me the freedom to take the time off that I need to engage in personal work. So that includes gratuitous type, but it also includes projects like this one. This is Lesson 100, which is a traveling pop-up shop created to promote gender wage parity by making it a little more tangible. I've done one in Pittsburgh and one in New Orleans so far. Uh, everything in the shop is designed and produced by women, and the way it works is that there are two prices on each item, one for men and uh, one for anyone. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Um, what, what, and obviously, for anyone identifying as a woman or a non-binary individual, um, the second price reflects the wage gap in that location. So, for instance, in the Pennsylvania shop, women paid 76% of the price, and uh, in New Orleans, they paid 66, which is pretty fucked up, actually. Um, but more recently, I also took off uh, about three months this past fall to work as a designer in residence at the Facebook Analog Research Lab in Menlo Park, California. Um, so these are just a few things that I made there. Unfortunately, I haven't had time to really document it yet. These are just from Instagram, so sorry. Um, but to get on to gratuitous type, I started this project while working as an art director at uh, Condé Nast in their in-house art department doing sort of corporate branding and collateral, but mostly engaged with uh, advertorials, which is like, uh, you know, uh, kind of roll your eyes when you hear that word. Uh, and the, the, the job primarily was to make pretty boring household projects look appealing. And the side note, it's really hard to make a duffel bag of tampons look good, um, but I tried. Uh, and so I was kind of unfulfilled in that position and having a long-standing love of magazines and editorial design, I started thinking about channeling some of that creative energy into a magazine project focused on graphic design. Uh, kind of simultaneously, as I was starting to pull the magazine together, I was thinking about this phenomena that you see in design generally, but especially in editorial design, where someone throws a big letter on a page and all the designers around go wild, you know, myself included. And, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. Uh, I've done it, I do it. I'm just observing that we're really suckers for some gratuitously big letters. And I started thinking about a letter being so titillating that it needed to be censored. So this is the cover of the very first issue of Gratuitous Type. It had this paper wrap that obscured the letter underneath uh, as if it were hiding something really scandalous. But of course, it's just a totally innocuous letter A. And um, I liked the approach of this because um, right away, it sort of made it obvious that this was a magazine that didn't take itself too seriously. And uh, that was an important stance for me, in part because at the time, I was very insecure about my work. I had only been working professionally for about two years. Uh, I'm also a self-taught self, a self designer, and so I did for some worry, reason worry about people, and I don't know who those people were, but these people who would question someone so inexperienced um, creating a magazine about graphic design. I also sort of um, feared that there were already too many magazines out there or that people would be critical. People would see all the sort of flourishes in eye candy and feel that the project was too frivolous. And so the name gratuitous type became this way of acknowledging this, of kind of winking at the criticisms that might be leveled on the magazine and in doing so maybe disarming them. So the name gratuitous type is I guess a joke and an apology at the same time and uh, I realized last night 
as I was thinking about this, that that maybe says a lot about how I operate in the world. <laughs> but um, beyond the name, contextualizing the magazine in the world of the pornographic also let me have a lot of fun with conventions of the genre and started giving me a framework that I could use to build the magazine around. So for instance, each issue has a centerfold, which features a special project. Uh, I also played with language, uh, more so in the earlier issues, but I did things like type affairs, where I asked designers to outline their relationships with various typefaces over the course of their career, highlighting long-term loves and maybe more sordid, fleeting flirtations with uh, trendy typography. It also lets me do really highbrow stuff like this. <laughs> My parents are proud of me. Um, I had Tim Lehan make this for me to use as a loader on our webpage. Um, I haven't gotten around to adding it yet, actually, but uh, I will. Uh, and here are a couple more quick images of the first issue. Uh, and then just some other things to quickly note about how this came together. My guiding editorial goal was really just as simple as wanting to highlight work by designers I admired. Uh, representing a diverse range of material and people and things that excited me, to do so in a way that was accessible and lighthearted and also presented in a format that is beautiful and inspiring. Uh, I wrote everything myself, uh, and up until the most recent issue I've published, uh, I've continued to do that, but we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, I also funded, promoted, distributed the magazine on my own. Now I work with Antenna Books in the UK and Europe for some distribution. I have a part-time employee, Lane Filio, who helps me in my studio and also with mailing and distribution, but largely it's a one-woman operation. This is the second issue of Gratuitous Type. Um, I think now is a good place to note that I've never really had a, a plan for this project. It's grown organically since its conception. When I first published the issue, the first issue, um, being riddled with self-doubt, as you can tell. <laughs> I wasn't sure that I'd follow through with a second issue, but it did seem to resonate with enough people that I felt it was a worthwhile effort to, to keep uh, following. Uh, I also thought, you know, I saw the first issue and I was proud of it, but I thought I could do better. And that's something I've always loved about making magazines. Their serial nature really leaves the door open for you to always do better next time. Um, so in deciding to do the next issue, I also determined that moving forward, each one would look different. All the full issues are the same size, they're saddle stitched, but beyond that, everything changes, uh, including production details. And this is really purely um, a selfish choice. I see this project as a space for me to play and allowing myself to redesign each issue gives me the freedom to do that. Um, in this issue, I also started commissioning more photography, including shooting most of the work that's featured. And as far as gratuitous type itself goes, I'm not of the camp that the work should be left alone to speak for itself. I, I think you can find so much design inspiration online in its pure form that in this printed format, I really want to contribute something unique, even if it's a small thing, um, like, sh like showing the work I feature in a new way. Uh, here's another centerfold, actually, Mark. My studio mate, who I mentioned earlier, did this for me. Uh, it's actually how we met, so a lot of cool things have come out of this project. It was a series of stickers. It kind of hid something underneath. Um, this is actually type of affairs that Astra did, and it's one of my favorite things that I put in the magazine. She's fabulous. Um, and then one last thing I decided when I got serious about continuing to publish the magazine, as Ellen kind of mentioned, was that I would give myself uh, freedom in terms of vo avoiding any kind of consistent production schedule. And at first I worried, you know, if I waited too long, uh, it would seem unprofessional, people would forget about the project. But I decided it was more important to take my time uh, to enjoy the process and give myself the space I needed to complete something I was satisfied with. Uh, I don't want to put more things out into the world just to do it, and so uh, it's really important to me to take my time, as much time as I need with gratuitous type, and I think that does help make the project feel more special. Um, that said, I, I took a lot of time with this issue, and it was the one where uh, I still got everything wrong. So <laughs> not in design, maybe in design, but there were typos, there were color issues, all kinds of things that at the time felt like disasters. But um, again, you know, when you make a magazine, you just try to do it better next time, and you make these mistakes and you realize you're still alive, and that's a, like a great lesson I've kind of learned in doing this. Uh, and so now I've published four and a half issues. Uh, i quickly flip, flip through the rest. This is issue C, uh, which was the third issue, the first themed one I've done, the theme is 
color. And for each issue, I've carried through the concept of obscuring or censoring the cover content in some way, in this case, with a die cut that only lets you see a slice of the image color underneath it. Uh, I've also, you know, as time has gone on, pushed the styling of the images in the magazine further. Um, this is a centerfold by Maureen Dorcel. Again, French, so I'm probably ruining it. Um, <laughs> these are Risograph postcards by another name I'll butcher, Jordi van den Nuzwendek, who's awesome, but I've never been able to say his name. Uh, and these came along with the issue, and a lot of the issues have little inserts and all kinds of little special things. Um, that's been a big part of, of the project. Although, uh, the more you produce, uh, the more you get sick of putting those things in by hand. Uh, so I've cut back on that a little bit, uh, or had the printer do it. Uh, this is issue four. Uh, it has an acetate cover, less of a pure censorship than some of the other covers, but still playing with layers and hiding aspects of the images. Also, uh, my printer was really sad about this acetate because it generated all this static on the press and they had to do it all by hand. And uh, the nice thing about changing the production details is you realize why things don't work and then you don't have to do them anymore. Uh, so a lot of troubleshooting and then we move on. Uh, so just a few more pages. And uh, now, most recently, I've published uh, my issue 4.5. Um, and this, there are so many interesting topics and ideas that come up in putting the magazine together, but in the interest of space or just staying focused on design, they don't get much, as much play in the magazine as I would like. Uh, so for the last couple years, I've been wanting to basically make a supplement to each issue that uses some of the ideas that come up in conversations as jumping off points for new pieces. So the half issues stand up on their own, but also enhance the content of the sister issue. And uh, you can see the production is much simpler. It's printed in one color on the interior, two on the cover. You can't tell from the slides, but they're also a little smaller. And I actually do repeat myself a bit. I use some of the same type and graphic elements utilized in the sister issue, although I have continued to play with them and hopefully push them in some new directions. So uh, you're caught up. And uh, I'm just getting momentum on my second issue, uh, or it might not even be an issue. It's kind of TBD, and that will be out, I guess, the end of this year or spring, or I really don't know. <laughs> I won't commit. So uh, thanks. That's it for now.